Good morning again. In this talk, we use the data from the Peninsula Ranges Batholith of the previous talk, combined with isotopic data from the Sierra Nevada Batholith, to show that most of the plutons were not generated by arc magmatism as commonly believed, but instead originated by a different process from the mantle and are the missing link in the formation of continental crust. This slide shows the crystallization ages of greater than 100,000 detrital zircons, modified from Hawksworth et al. 2016. The origin of the peaks and valleys on this plot are contentious, largely because they are difficult to interpret using crustal growth models, where the bulk of crust is created by arc magmatism, as that is a continuous process and would not lead to the observed peaks and valleys. Most workers interpret the peaks as some sort of preservation peaks, where crust is sequestered from subsequent recycling because it was isolated from younger collisions. But these models are not very fulfilling to us because they don't actually specify a process that could produce the peaks. We believe that our model for the origin of continental crust uses observed magmatism and its compositions to suggest an alternative method to generate continental crust. Most geoscientists believe that the continental crust formed principally by water-induced melting of the mantle wedge above subduction zones to produce juvenile basaltic melts, which then rise into the crust where they fractionate. This paradigm is problematic because geologists estimate the bulk composition of continental crust to be andesitic to dacitic, with just over 60% silica, yet magmas rising into the crust within arcs are basaltic. The contradictory nature of the two concepts creates what Roberta Rudnick called the crustal composition paradox. The paradox is typically resolved with a circular argument that involves large-scale lower crustal foundering of residual material dominated by a variety of cumulates from the base of magmatically thickened arc crusts. In the arc model, the dense cumulates and restites must exist because most crust is manufactured in arcs. However, the estimated amount of fractional crystallization necessary to create rocks with a composition of upper crust from arc basalt is about 86%, and based on mantle xenoliths from the Sierra Nevada, along with cross-sections of older arcs such as Coastan, greater than 2 to 1 for bulk crust. Thus, because the generally accepted model for the bulk of crust formation is arc magmatism, huge volumes of residue must form in the lower crust and then be removed, presumably by gravitational foundering. However, not only are there problems with the contrasting bulk compositions, but the standard model also fails because prior to collision, most arcs do not have thick crust, as shown in nearly every illustration of an arc. In the late 1960s, Warren Hamilton hypothesized that because the only modern volcanic fields of comparable size to the great Mesozoic batholiths of the Western Americas are andenotype volcanic fields, batholiths must exist beneath volcanic arcs. The idea took hold, and ever since, most geologists have assumed that Cordilleran batholiths were generated above subduction zones in high standing regions of great crustal thickness, generated by voluminous arc magmatism. Our evaluation suggests that these ideas are largely incorrect. When we examine all of today's active continental arcs, we find that the majority are contrary to the batholithic paradigm, characterized by sequences of rocks erupted and deposited with subsiding basins, not volcanoes sitting on high-standing thick crust. Young examples include both the modern and ancestral Miocene Cascades, where the volcanoes in their debris aprons subsided in Graben, the low-standing Alaskan Peninsula, where volcanoes such as Augustine are partially submerged in Cook Inlet. The Kamchatka Peninsula of easternmost Russia, where towering stratovolcanoes such as Kluchoyevskoy, pictured here, erupt in extensive fault-bounding troughs located close to sea level. Japan, where stratocones and calderas sit near sea level throughout the islands. The North Island of New Zealand, where the Taupo Zone sector of the arc is actively extending as calderas and stratocones erupt. The Central American Arc, where volcanoes are aligned in a long, linear, low-standing depression. Of course, the Campanian Volcanic Arc of Italy, with Mount Vesuvius located on the Gulf of Naples, and I left out the Hellenic Arc, where volcanoes like Santorini form islands in the Aegean Sea. Furthermore, the stratigraphy within pendants and wall rocks of Cordilleran batholiths 
provides no evidence for thick crust, as the volcanic rocks are intercalated with shallow marine sedimentary rocks, and therefore sat at sea level or below during volcanism. Thus, where arcs are concerned, the high-standing Andes are the outlier, typically, typically, simply atypical of modern and ancient arcs. Arcs get thick crust beneath them when they collide and override continents. For those who weren't there for our previous talk, we showed how the Peninsula Range's origin in southern and Baja California is readily interpreted to represent the collision of a lower Cretaceous arc with a west-facing Cretaceous passive margin at about 100 million years. The collision ended when the subducting slab failed. Soon after collision and terminal closure of the basin, seemingly within a million years, the collisional hinterland was intruded by a voluminous suite of post-collisional 99 to 86 million year old mesozonal to catazonal plutons. The bodies were intruded during a period of rapid exhumation when rocks at a depth of 15 to 23 kilometers were brought to the surface in less than 10 million years by detachment faulting and collapse. Rapid exhumation is also documented by abundant coarse plutonic debris, such as boulder beds containing class up to 2.5 meters in diameter, as well as abundant 100 to 90 million year detrital zircons deposited during the Cenomanian Turonian in a basin located to the west of the collision zone. The post-collisional break-off plutons shown in black are compositionally distinct from the older arc magmas shown in red and green. The traditional idea for these types of plutons is the subduction of an easterly dipping oceanic slab shallowed and rising arc magmas assimilated continental crust to form the plutons. Workers had simply not appreciated the significance of the regional deformation at 100 million years. Because Joe and I suggested that the post-100 million year plutonic suite was not related to subduction, but instead related to slab breakoff, we compared the geochemistry of young arcs situated on both oceanic and continental crust and found no significant differences, which was somewhat unexpected, but led us to conclude that arc magmas do not generally assimilate large quantities of continental crust. The Cretaceous rocks of the Sierra Nevada batholith are similar to those of the peninsula ranges with arc-like magmatism during the Aptian Albium and a 100 million year deformational event followed by the emplacement of scads of plutons ranging in age from about 98 to 84 million years. On this map of the Sierra and Batholith, I've colored purple some of the major plutonic complexes, which are collectively known as the Sierra and Crest Magmatic Suite, and are younger than 100 million years. Like those of the peninsula ranges, we consider them to be post-collisional. From north to south, they are the Sonora, the Tuolumne, the John Muir, the Mount Whitney, and dome lands. There are many others as well, but these are the best known. The geological sketch map shows some of the important relations. You can see folded volcanic rocks in greens intercalated with marble, attesting to their shallow marine nature. Detrital zircon peaks from sedimentary rocks are younger than 103 million years and are cut by the 102 million year granite diorite of Lake Harriet, shown here in brown which was deformed and metamorphosed along with the volcanic rocks. The 96 million year old Sonoran Pass and Ptolemy intrusive suites post-date the deformation and constrain it to be older than 96 million years. From this, you can see that there was insufficient time to thicken the crust magmatically. Here are some of our diagrams showing the pre and post 100 million year suites of the peninsula ranges and here we overlay data from the similar age rocks of the Sierra Nevada. The 120 million year Stokes Mountain rocks are exposed along the western edge of the batholith and only shown on the two diagrams on the right because we didn't have elements, uh, the rare earth elements uh, in the diagrams on the left. Whereas there, the, the post 100 million year rocks outcrop farther to the east. Here are some of the results of a wonderful study of oxygen isotopes in Sierra and Plutons by Jade Star Lackey. North is to the left. Note that the arc rocks of the Stokes Mountain Complex have mantle-like del-18 in zircon values as expected. What is probably not expected is that the post-100 million year plutons such as the Sonora, Tuolumne, and so forth in blues and green 
also have menthol-like delatine zircon values, showing the lack of crustal input. Here is a plot of whole rock delatine oxygen versus initial strontium. Note the elevated strontium values in the Sierra and Crest and La Posta suites compared to the Santa Ana Arc suite of the Peninsula ranges. Note also that Sierra and peroxonite xenoliths from the mantle, which were brought to the surface during Miocene, have elevated strontium isotopes similar to those of the post-collisional Sierra and Crest plutons. This plot of initial epsilon neodymium versus initial strontium ratios compares the pre and post 100 million year rocks. Note that the pre 100 million year arc rocks shown in green symbols generally plot above Chur or chondritic uniform reservoir, whereas the post 100 million year rocks shown in red plot below it. Arc rocks generally plot above Chur as illustrated by the fields for Lassen Volcano and Crater Lake of the Cascade Volcanic Arc. Likewise, mid-Cretaceous spinel peridotite and garnet lazulite xenoliths brought to the surface in the Sierras by Miocene diatremes also plot with the arc rocks. Mid-Cretaceous garnet peroxonite xenoliths shown with purple crosses and Cenozoic basalts of the Snake River Plain shown with small black crosses have more evolved isotopic compositions and plot below Chur with the post 100 million year plutons. The basalts the basalts provide an important constraint on the nature of the problem. Marlon Jean, Barry Hanlon, and John Chauvet use three component mixing models, utilizing one, the oceanic island basalt like westernmost Columbia River lava, erupted west of the inferred continental edge to represent the plume component, two, old lithosphere like that of the Wyoming craton, and three, younger paleoproterozoic like lithosphere to show that greater than 97% of the variability can be accounted for by progressive incorporation of older subcontinental manolithosphere into the plume source as it migrated eastward. Note that the lower crust beneath the Snake River Plain is old and radiogenic, with 8786 strontium as high as 0 0.83 and epsilon neodymium values ranging from minus 20 to minus 50, as deduced from xenoliths by Bill Lehman years ago. And so if the deep mantle plume melts, which contained very low rubidium concentrations, interacted with the crust in any appreciable way, it would be readily apparent. Because the post-collisional Sierran rocks have mantle-like del-18 oxygen values, they did not assimilate continental crust, and therefore the radiogenic isotopes must have been derived from the mantle. The arc plutons reflect the lack of old cratonic subcontinental lithosphere beneath it whereas the post-collisional plutons attest to the presence of thick, evolved subcontinental lithospheric mantle of the North American craton. If you look at post-collisional slab failure magmas in collision zones without old evolved cratonic lithosphere, like the coast battle of the British Columbia, they have the typical trace element signatures of the post-collisional breakoff magmas, but have more primitive neodymium values that plot above Chur. Note that in the case of post-collisional magmatism, the subcontinental manacle, mantle typically belongs to the lower plate continental margin and not the arc, as the continental margin is pulled beneath the arc to isolate it from its formerly subjacent mantle. Thus, where old cratonic lithosphere is pulled beneath an arc built on young crust, adjacent arc and slab failure magmas may have very different isotopic ratios simply because the arc magmas rose through young arc lithosphere, whereas the younger slab failure magmas rose through old and rich lithosphere that was partially subducted beneath the arc just prior to slab failure. Likewise, where both upper and lower plates are young, they both should exhibit less radiogenic isotopic values. We compiled thousands of phanerozoic arc and post-collisional plutons, as well as rocks of the 2.5 to 3.8 billion year TTG, or tonalite trongemite granite suite, worldwide, which are compositionally similar to, similar to our post-collisional breakoff magmas, and found that our division into two dominant suites, arc and slab breakoff, appeared to go back as far as about 3.8 billion years ago. On plots of every element, we find that the composition of bulk continental crust, as estimated by Roberta Rudnick, plots in between the arc and breakoff magmas, which suggested to us that the crustal composition paradox could be resolved 
if continental crust is generated by both arc and slab failure magmatism, both of which ultimately are derived from the mantle. Note the bulk continental crust is shown on each of these four plots by the blue star in the middle. Although we didn't discuss it in detail here, our overall model for the generation of slab failure magmas involves, like atakites of slab windows, initial melting of metabasalt and gabbro from the subducted oceanic slab at depth greater than 2 gigapascals to create siliceous magmas with the diagnostic trace element patterns. As the melts rise through the subcontinental mantle lithosphere, they are contaminated by fractional melting. And if the lithospheric mantle is old and enriched, the melts developed isotopic signatures commonly considered to be crustal. So, here we are back again where we started with detrital zircons. Note that both the detrital zircon and the metamorphic peaks correspond with periods of supercontinental assembly through time. Because the assembly of supercontinents involves collisions, and since every collision involves failure of the lower plate, we suggest that the detrital zircon peaks are dominantly created by slab failure magmatism. As collisional hinterlands with their post-collisional break-off plutons are typically exhumed and eroded, they provide huge numbers of detrital zircons to adjacent post-collisional basins that are reflected in the observed peaks. We argue that this plot is precisely what one would expect if slab failure, crustal recycling, and some form of plate tectonics have been active processes since about 3.8 billion years ago. Now I'm sure that Joe will entertain any questions that you might have.